Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I'm your host and producer. My name is James Pogoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And at the other end of the tin can and string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from the Wide Left Substack. He is Mr. Useful Human, Arif Hassan. Arif, true or false, the fake punt, or the, the fourth and one attempt anyway, from DeMar Hamlin is what sunk his comeback of the year uh, chances this year against Joe Flacco. Yeah, pretty rough that actually putting him on the field hurt his chances to win the comeback player of the year award. Like, it's he was probably going to end up losing it anyway to Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco just kind of played out of his mind. But at the same time, the fact that his play is what hurt him, I feel it kind of flies in the face of the comeback right. of the year award. Well, So he was such an overwhelming favorite to win the award that actually some books took him, took that bet off, right? Because he was like minus 5,000 like in week 16 and in week 17, they're like, all right, that's it. We're not going to take any more DeMar Hamlin or any more comeback player of the year award bets. So he was such an overwhelming favorite that I'm still kind of surprised he didn't win because like it is a narrative award and obviously you can come up with whatever framework you want for that. I mean, like we used to have debates about whether or not you can win the comeback player of the year award for coming back from being bad at football, which uh, history shows that yes, you can, you can win the award for finally playing well. Um, Or if it's injury related, or if Michael Vick can win the award after having gone to jail and it's, yeah, all of those things. So it's a fairly flexible award, but I still think we should ground it in. You have to like play and probably well uh, for you to win the award. Um, so I guess, I guess they've maintained the integrity of that meaningless award. I'm glad they've, they've drawn the line in the sand. Uh, <laughs> finally, also someone's doing something about it. It's, it's about time. Somebody does something about this ridiculousness. Also added for this episode, we have on the other end of the tin cannon string. This string has three ends. Please welcome former host of Norse Code and Gambling Degenerate, Dusty O'Connell. How you doing, Dusty? Um, hi. You know what? What was that? That was everything that Dusty is now. <laughs> no, it's a former self. Is yeah. Uh, no, it's a bit. It's from uh, uh, Fifth Element, which, like, when you get down, like, at its core, it's a movie about an otherwise normal guy getting invited on some weirdos podcast. So actually, yeah, I could see you doing the Bruce Willis thing right now. Yeah. That, that makes uh, sense. It, it, it took a I, while, but maybe <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking through fifth element in my head. Does that make me Chris to... Tucker? <laughs> I've got a question and I've got a comment. Wait, am I Lilu? Yes. <laughs> There's, there's 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 no there's no like way that you're not at this point. Congratulations. I'm sure you're dressed for the occasion. Uh we have plenty of stuff to talk about. Uh we are going to go over some some Super Bowl prop bets with our friend Mr. O'Connell here in just a moment. Uh we also have some breaking news and a little bit of Viking stuff and of course the mailbag as well, but before we start, thank you guys so much for listening to Norse Code. If you enjoy the show and would like to help us financially, you can do so in a couple of different ways. You can go over to patreon.com/norsecode and for $3.50 a month or a little less for the year subscription, you get access to bonus materials, access to the Discord, all of that. We just released a long-awaited Patreon bonus episode where Arif and I watched The Beekeeper and then reviewed it immediately afterwards and did some mailbag stuff as well. Um, I, You have to tune in to listen to our review to, to hear whether or not we enjoyed it, but uh, there was the, the bees were kept, I think is the best way to put oh it. Oh boy, were they ever kept. The bees, the bees were kept until they couldn't be. Um, yeah, and interestingly, the movie starts with, uh, spoiler by the way, the movie starts with hornets for some reason. Yeah, um, but, <laughs> but after that, it's all B, baby. What a what a glorious, 
glorious bit of cinema. Uh, and and we did we talked all about it. I think the episode's like about an hour. Uh, not just beekeeper stuff, but we did some mailbag stuff as well. So check that out. Patreon.com slash Norse Code. You can also go to paypal.me slash Norse Code as well for a one-time donation. Or you can be one of the fine folks over at NorseCode.Threadless.com where you can pick up any number of shirts, baby onesies, shower curtain, uh, if Dusty had an actual shower, like for a shower curtain, I would be getting you a shower curtain because I feel like you need that in the shower mat to just like, I, I'm, I'm sure your, I'm sure your husband would appreciate it. Oh, I, he's already been asking me for it. Yep. <laughs> like that. And like the flag, like you can get that for, uh, that, that, that belongs right above your turtles. Right. Do we, do we sell shower caps too? Cause you can get like a whole shower set. The moment the Threadless puts that as an option, I will get. We will have be giving out shower caps out at the out of the live show. Fantastic! I did uh, this weekend in in the Twin Cities. I did end up in two Vikings Pro Shops looking for Josh Dobbs jerseys on discount, and nobody had any. So I'm starting to think they may have been given away to third world countries, like they do, like the the printouts of the of the of the other of the losers. Right, the of the NFC Super Bowl. Championship Detroit Lions shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So I was a little disappointed I didn't run into any Josh Dobbs jerseys while I was down there, but I uh, I endeavored to persevere. Didn't didn't the Viking social media team like make a whole deal famously, about how they had? Yeah, famously <laughs> they did. So I thought there has to be at least a couple. There were there were Lewis Seen's kid jerseys, but I didn't see anything involving, uh, and I think I saw an Ed Ingram as well. Which, that's, oh god, that's a whoa boy, yeah, that. Um, but I didn't see anything in the way of Josh Dobbs, so I was a little disappointed, admittedly. But let's get into uh, let's get into a little bit of news, and uh, we can start with Mike Zimmer has been hired. Uh, Mike Zimmer is uh, looks to be the defensive coordinator for the Cowboys for the 2024-2025 season. Yeah, I I think that's really cool. I, I don't think there's a ton of Vikings fans who have like um, a lingering resentment or anything like that with Mike Zimmer. They're really happy with what he did for the team. Uh, they mostly felt it was time for him, uh, time for you know the the two sides to go apart. You know when it was over, but not like any like. Um, you know, bad feelings. So I think a lot of Vikings fans are happy that he's back in football. Obviously, he his whole life like revolves around football. Like, you know, when you would ask him like, hey, if you weren't coaching football, what would you be doing? And he thought about that answer for like 30 seconds, like a long time. And then he said coaching high school football. Like there's no – his brain couldn't process the question, so he had to pretend that the question did not exclude high school football. <laughs> so – I'm glad he's coaching, but also he's like a very good coach. Um, and um, I'm kind of interested to see kind of how uh, Dallas fans write about Mike Zimmer uh, heading into the season. I kind of want to read those articles to see what their takeaways are of what he's done in Minnesota, because that would be, I think, kind of interesting. But I think he's a really great defensive mind. Um, Dallas has a lot of fantastic pieces. Obviously, Zimmer couldn't do much with the casts assembled in 2020 and 2021. Um, he is partly responsible for why the casts were assembled in that way. Um, but the Dallas just has a super talented defensive team. And so uh, there could be an opportunity there for for a really, really excellent defense. So I think that's really cool. Obviously, the story is also that he like was previously a Dallas defensive coordinator under like Bill Parcells. Uh, they ran a 3-4 defense at the time. But um, I just think mostly like, Dope. That's really cool. Seems like a great fit. I'm really curious to see how he and Mike McCarthy gel uh, next season. I, I wonder if there's going to be like a uh, Buddy Ryan, Kevin Gilbride moment where where Zimmer punches McCarthy out on the sideline. Um, I I would if I were offered odds on it, I would think about it. You know. Um, but yeah, I, that interesting. Like, I think for a lot of people, be like, oh, you know, they played against each other so often in the NFC North. And for me, it's more like Zimmer is very much in control of stuff, and Mike McCarthy very much feels like he's not, and he seems to be pretty lackadaisical about a lot of stuff. Uh, and to me, that's probably the conflict. Um, but hey, there could be any types of conflict there. I'm excited to see that emerge. I realize they've recently been, I believe they've recently been on one of the uh, HBO, like, inside shows. Um, but, like, 
I, I just want to see them as like a buddy cop movie. I want to see their interactions. <laughs> like, how are you this bad at like, how are you this bad at two minute, uh, two minute drills? How are you this bad at time management? And McCarthy be like, I don't know how I got jelly all over myself either, but here we are. And... <laughs> it's like Chris Farley and I guess I I guess Mike Zimmer would be David Spade, but I don't know if he would. No, I could see it. I think that works. An angry and somehow serious version of Norm Macdonald. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, just pair them all together. Uh, rips by the way Norm Macdonald Chris Farley yeah. but uh, yeah them in a buddy cop movie I think would would represent what, what the Dallas Cowboys could turn into if things go awry and now I'm very much cheering for things to go awry please I want this on hard knocks I will watch it and review it I, I need <laughs> I need their interactions on the sidelines during games please Jerry might push for it too that would be great oh yes Dallas has a history of hanging on to a coach like one season too long. So yeah, this, this just screams that this, this would be perfect. All right, let's get into uh, just a little bit of, uh, of Vikings rumors and innuendos, uh, mainly in the way of contract stuff. There's a bunch of Kirk rumors that have come out. We've been gone for the last couple of weeks, both because uh, I managed to get a migraine and Arif ended up in mobile and I didn't want to record and you know, all of that. I, I admit that I have a bad attitude. I admit that I have a, a, a low amount of hustle at times. So <laughs> we're back and we are here to talk about Kirk rumors and uh, a little bit about uh, about Kirk's dead cap moving forward this uh, this year. So the Kirk rumors originally were swirling about how he wanted to play for Belichick, who now is not coaching in the NFL in 2024. Uh, but there were rumors about him potentially going to uh, a team like the Falcons, something like that, if Belichick were to go over there. Uh, there's also been a few rumors about how, well, he's going to be the best quarterback available in free agency, and someone's going to end up overpaying him. So I guess the question is, how much is too much, and uh, what are your takes on the Kirk rumors so far this offseason? Um, so, I mean, the extension, so I think it was... Uh, Andrew Kramer on the Purple Insider podcast. I'm sorry, I don't keep up with other podcasts. <laughs> I'm so you I'm barely, sorry. You barely I, keep up with yours. I don't remember what we said three minutes ago. Um, yeah, I do know it was Andrew Kramer. And so whatever podcast he's on, it's that one where he said um, that evidently, you know, Kirk Cousins and his team offered an extension that they thought was well below market value. I think the word discount was used. At some point, I think Kramer said something like, it wasn't exactly $40 million, which is surprising to me because I think the very same podcast um, said last year that um, that they did offer a $40 million a year extension, which at the time I thought actually was fair. Um, so it, it sounds like it's below that, um, but the Vikings said no. And uh, my impression from that was that uh, Kirk's team offered an extension into 2025. So this is in 2023, a three-year extension uh, into 2025 that would fully guarantee Cousins through 2025, right? And the Vikings are are obviously they're concerned about cap it and stuff like that, but they're also extremely concerned about flexibility. And so fully guaranteeing um, a player is just, it's really difficult to do that um, because like one of the problems with fully guaranteeing a player, like aside from the fact that you can't like cut a player, obviously is fully guaranteed, like that, the Denver Broncos are living through that. Um, it's also that you can't restructure a player very easily who is fully guaranteed because a lot of that's in signing bonus and everything that you restructure has to be included in the restructure. And so you end up dumping like $70 million into the next year. So like it's more difficult to restructure that. So it, it creates a lot of um, static when you need dynamic movement. When I mean, the Vikings see the cap as something that you need to be a lot really agile around, right? And and so that's it sounded like that's the reason that they said no. Um, obviously, Kirk's not going to be able to play for Belichick. I think uh, someone also mentioned like, hey, you know, what about Arthur Smith? You know, which uh, you know, people have talked about Kirk Cousins as like an Arthur Smith quarterback kind of in the background. Um, like people are talking all the time about how he's a Kyle Shanahan quarterback. But I, I've seen some people be like, yeah, he's an Arthur Smith guy. Look at what Atlanta is doing. Look at what Tennessee is doing. 
Uh, and I don't personally see it because Atlanta did a bunch of quarterback runs and stuff, but I see kind of the rest of it. Um, and now that Arthur Smith is in Pittsburgh and Kenny Pickett is bad, uh, you know, there was some rumors there, but it was more like, is this a good fit rumors? And not like by sources indicate that Cousins would love to play for Mike Tomlin. It wasn't that. It was more like, hey, they, they need a quarterback, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, if he hits the market, there's going to be a market. Um, but, yeah, it, it's it's really it, the 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 team offered the Cousins team offered a deal that the te- that the NFL team, the Vikings didn't want. And and that itself is is kind of the news and kind of what that means going. But I think it's just a structure thing. If Cousins is as adamant about structure as he has been in the past and is seemingly capable of being in the future, then obviously it's going to be really difficult to to sign him to an extension. Um, uh, as a as kind of a, a recap, you know the Vikings have all the incentive in the world to sign an extension for Cousins. And there's two reasons for that. One is that there's essentially a mandate from ownership, or at least that's our understanding, that they need to be as competitive as possible every single year, right? So they want to be able to make the playoffs this year. Hard to do that with a rookie quarterback. Obviously, CJ Stroud, you know, kind of helps you make your case for you, but it's hard to do that with a rookie quarterback, right? Um, so you having a veteran quarterback who has been leading some really efficient offenses is a big part of that. That's great. Um, but also the Vikings are going to carry a twenty eight and a half million dollar dead cap hit from Kirk Cousins next year. Right. And so uh, and, and he, if he's not on the roster, right, thirty million dollars, nearly thirty million dollars in dead space is a lot to deal with. That is. Really difficult to navigate around. Right. And, and so extending him would potentially create cap problems in the future or whatever. But it does alleviate the cap right now, which is something that does need some level of amelioration, right? Like it needs some level of reduction. Um, and if you signed Kirk to, let's say, a four-year, $160 million deal, right? So $40 million a year, let's say uh, $40 million of it is in a uh, signing bonus, which, boy, um, that'd be a pretty big signing bonus. But like, let's say that's the case. Um and then it is uh, 120 for the next four years. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm going to try to game this out on the calculator real quick. Uh, then, um, then you end up with a cap hit, and we and we have a base salary of one uh, million for the first year, right? Um, then you have a cap hit of about. $21 million next year with the quarterback on the roster and an enormous signing bonus, as opposed to a cap of $28 million without it. But if you have a minimal signing bonus, let's say the signing bonus is $10 million, um, and you still offer him like $40 million a year over the course of four years, which is how many void years is kind of out there. It's void up until 2027. Um, you could end up with, let's see if I'm doing the math right. Um, you could end up with uh, a $13.75 million cap it. So um, you can get the cap hit relatively low with an extension and you get to have a quarterback on the roster or you can just eat those twenty eight and a half million dollars in cap hit. So the Vikings do have an enormous incentive to extend cousins from a cap perspective. It actually does create additional flexibility if you don't think about like, you know, what cousins want, which is a guarantee. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I do think that if you if you do that, you do actually create additional room that allows you to um, you know, sign Justin Jefferson, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, uh, Justin Jefferson's cap hit next year is 19 million. If you extend him, um, then you can reduce the year one cap hit. Uh, obviously it depends on the signing bonus. So it's like one fifth of whatever that is plus a million. Uh, and that's, that's your cap hit. Um, so if you do like a five year, let's say he wants, uh, 40 million a year. So the same as Kirk, I guess. Uh, and you do a signing bonus of um, also let's say forty million, so a bit over five years instead of four. Uh, and your your one salary is like one million. Um, that means a year one cap hit of nine million instead of nineteen million. So you actually clear up ten million dollars in cap space. So those are all possible. You can actually extend Jefferson and reduce your cap hit next year. You can extend Kirk and reduce your cap hit next year. The extensions actually reduce cap, not add to it. Which leads me to Justin Jefferson stuff because, of course, there's been uh, discussions over at uh, over in Media Row because they desperately want to see Justin Jefferson on a, on a team that's not the Vikings. Um, 
it's a thing uh about uh, how much he wants to get paid and everything how much is too much for justin jefferson i think i think anything over 40 is probably too much <laughs> uh i think was it tyreek's at like 30 and that was signed a couple years ago and that's like one of the higher hits um if you do like the cap math of the percentage cap math i think it's it's about there um tyreek signed as if he was the the best receiver in the nfl at the time um and I think that let me take a quick look at contract history so I can I can get this fully correct. Um, and I think that like a similar cap percentage, right? So he signed at fourteen point four percent of the twenty twenty two cap. So if we take a look at uh, what the, which is thirty million a year. So if we take a look at the Vikings uh, or not the Vikings, the NFL's cap, which is two hundred forty two million, and do fourteen point four of that. Uh, that's thirty five million. So I guess forty is a little high. But, um, you know, I, I think probably anything in that range is when you go, oh, my God, we're paying him quarterback money. We're paying him Daniel Jones money. That's nuts. Oh, I think that's oh, kind of oh, weird. Oh, oh. <laughs> it burns, but it's so good. <laughs> they, they, made, they made their choices. Yeah, they, he, he won a playoff game. You got to pay the man. You have to. You have to pay him. You, then you're There's gonna have no a, other choice. You can have a no whole. You can have a whole off season talking about uh, how much you love the Italian community and your and your new backup quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I, I wonder if, like, after that was happening, Daniel Jones was like, you frantically scrambling to get a 23 and Me to see if you can, like, hey, no, I'm Italian too. <laughs> can I do a Can I do a video with the uh, with meals by Cujone too? Like. <laughs> That was the, for me. That was peak. The fact that was that fantastic. Yeah. He was on there reviewing Parm. And, yeah, that. Yeah, chicken palm. Yeah. What what ridiculousness? Well, there's not much more in the way of uh, of rumors and innuendo, so we are going to get straight to the Super Bowl prop bets. And we brought on a degenerate gambler in Dusty O'Connell uh, to speak to another degenerate gambler, uh, Arif Hassan, about. I've never uh, gambled in my life. No, never. You rode with you. You drove with me around uh, around Minneapolis for a while this weekend. I wouldn't uh, say that you've never gambled. Um, which, <laughs> by the way, I'm glad that I was able to return you to your ancestral home of Bloomington briefly uh, that this was weekend. Rough. That was nice. that was fantastic. Uh, Dusty, are you uh, are you ready to take the wheel and uh, and drive for a little bit and uh, discuss some prop bets? I've got my fat stack of Drew Majesties. I was born ready. You know, I've never reached zero Drew Majesties in 10 years of uh, making fake prop bets on the Super Bowl. Boy, the Drew Majesties is like, that's a deep cut. That's old lore. <laughs> that is old lore. We're 10 years like in. To... We're breaking out the uh, we're breaking out the Drew Majesties. Explain that uh, for the people and let's get into some prop bets. No. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're getting into the prop bets. Just, yes. I'm just not going to explain. I, I, I actually thought you were saying no to both there. And I'm like, all right, so let's go to the mailbag. And the first is, question is. This has been episode 505 of Norse Code. James will be back next week. <laughs> Successfully learned his lesson. <laughs> yeah. Again, you know, it just keeps. I keep thinking it'll be different. And it's never different. Nope. It's, <laughs> it's never been the same since the reef walked in, since, since Dusty rather walked into the bar in Denver with a, uh, with the pillow and people commented on it as you're walking in. <laughs> hey, he's got, <laughs> I, so I'm walking in from the parking lot and there's these people sitting out on the patio smoking a cigarette and you know, they're all like within 10 years of retirement on their way there. And the one guy goes, that fella brought his porn pillow. <laughs> And, you know, I, I, at that point, I was just like handcuffed by his words. I had nothing to say. You're like, I, I, Honestly, of, of all the all the Norse code regulars, I would have expected Damian Barrett to have heard that sentence before anyone else. But I guess it was Dusty. Nope, it had to be Dusty. All right, let's start off, Dusty. All right. Uh, so to start with the actual play props because you know there's there's all the fun uh silly ones that we'll get to but i think there are uh some fun bets in this game that we can uh take a look at because it's funny super bowls are unique among football games but you also have like the most information about the teams that are playing them so uh given 
the way that Kansas City has kind of conducted themselves in the playoffs. Uh, my first selection is Marquez Valdez Scantling uh, to reach over 19 and a half receiving yards. Uh, I think that's kind of bold, actually. Um, what is what is MVS's uh, average over the past couple of games? I know he had a, a big one last week, or not last week, last game. But do you have like his numbers over the past couple of weeks? Well, that's the thing is that uh, his average in the playoffs is uh, below that. But as we've seen, his use has been more of like uh, as a gadget player or, you know, there's there's a specific route they want to run with him or, you know, he's uh, uh, further up the uh, depth ch- or further up the uh, progression for certain plays. And I think if he does, I mean, he's only he's going to get those 19 and a half receiving yards in, you know, one or two plays most likely. So if yeah. he sees the ball, then. Then that's an over. Uh, so that's so that's why you're comfortable. That's with an it. over. Like, this is this is a, a minus one twenty. So it's, um, I mean they 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 lay the juice pretty aggressively on the Super Bowl bets. But for a player prop, it's not as bad. It's normally at minus one ten. So this is like basically even. So you think it's essentially a little bit better than even odds that he's just gonna get one catch. Yeah, I think it's a little bit better than a coin flip. Okay, which I think cool. you know is is value. Uh, I think the Chiefs to win the first quarter by a shutout at plus 320 is pretty good value. In the last, uh, well, in the playoffs this year, the 49ers have averaged about two possessions. And uh, they tend to score in the regular season more than most teams do on their first possession, but much less than other teams in the playoffs. And... uh, you know, given the strength of scheme that Andy Reid tends to deploy for the Chiefs, I think I can easily see a road where the Chiefs have a drive that chews up a lot of clock and scores, and the 49ers have a drive that uh, chews up a lot of clock or not very much and doesn't score, and then they, you know, may get one more bite at the apple before the end of the quarter. I think it's a low drive total, low possession total in the first quarter that's going to help drive this. Um one thing about like these prop bets is that you can get really caught up in your own head about narrative building, about how, oh, I can see how this happens and this happens and this happens. And it kind of closes you off to the possibility of like normal variance. So it's like that's the concern with like the way that you've constructed the first quarter by shut up. But I do like it. I think it's a it's a, it's a pretty story. Um, the fact that the 49ers have been – pretty bad in the first three quarters of the past couple of games. Plus obviously the chiefs passing defense is really high level. Um, I think there's something there. The, the biggest concern is like a breakaway Christian McCaffrey run. Like that to me is like the thing that makes this really difficult, especially because I have um, over a one and a half field goals for both kickers uh, in the game. And so uh, I could see the 49ers getting, you know, shit out of the end zone, but I don't know about no field goals. So that one, that one's kind of curious to me, but a plus three twenty, I mean, that's like pretty good odds. Yeah. And you're right. And that is a somewhat complicated narrative to construct uh, for a long shot. You know, that's always a a dangerous way to think. So uh, my next pick is uh, Brock Purdy to throw at least one interception. I love it. I love that one. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Don't have to think too hard about that one. Yeah, I have, a, I have a lot of unders on, on the 49ers, which we'll get into when we get to my portion of it. But yeah, for now, I'll just say, yeah, dope, let's go. And in that same vein, uh, I think a, a safe bet is uh, Isaiah Pacheco to score a touchdown anytime. Yeah, I mean, I think that the way – so the the biggest thing for me, and this is me doing narrative building, um, so I could just be overthinking it. But the biggest thing for me is that in the Super Bowl – the Chiefs do just crazy stuff, uh, especially near uh, the. It's crazy that we've got enough of a sample size of the Chiefs to be like, hey, so it, in Super Bowls, this is what the Chiefs have historically done. But in Super Bowls, the Chiefs have historically been very weird when they get to the red zone, uh, where uh, you know, like Kadarius Tony gets that touchdown, and then they they leverage off the Kadarius Tony play to give um, the other guy who's not Kadarius Tony, uh, Sky Moore. Um, the touchdown, right? Or they'll they'll do like their weird, you know, ring around the rosy thing, right? 
um, they'll shuffle pass uh, or they'll have Blake Bell, you know, do a quarterback sneak or whatever. It's like stuff they haven't done before. So that's the one concern here is that this is a, a shockingly traditional play. Um, and so at minus 125, I'm like raising an eyebrow, but hey man, he could catch the ball too. Like this is an anytime touchdown. So this is like, you've got a lot of opportunities for this to work out for you. Um, yeah. Well, I, I like Pacheco a lot, so this doesn't really bother me. I think I have him at over, the Vegas line on him is like 70 plus rushing yards, right? So this is a touchdown possibility there. Yeah, which I uh, would probably not bet on, but if you twisted my arm, I'd probably take the under. And like my thing with Pacheco is that you know, you're right about the Chiefs doing crazy stuff in the red zone uh, in the Super Bowl. But one thing they will very rarely do, and yes, I know Andy Reid knows it as much as anyone else, is uh, send Patrick Mahomes in uh, like a super short yardage situation. So if you yeah, – like yeah, they, yeah, I agree I th- actually on that one. I don't think, I think that that's going to break their tendency on that one because it's built around an injury concern. Yeah, and, I, and exactly. I think they're going to want to protect uh, – Mahomes as much as they can. So that I think that's where that uh, play gets kind of its extra value that makes that yeah, it to more yeah, than like a flip for me. And, yeah. you know, if you feel great about that, then you can parlay it with uh, shortest touchdown at under one and a half yards. Or uh, if you don't feel great about it, you think that uh, Andy Reid's going to uh, gamble with the, uh, the uh, half billion dollar yeah. man. Yeah, I was trying to do the math and I was, but yeah, the $500 million man. Uh, then use it as a hedge. The uh, under is minus one fifty. Oh yeah, actually, I do. I do like that as a hedge. Uh, I feel like we would be remiss as Norse Code if we did not suggest either kicker hitting the uprights or crossbar on a missed kick as a viable bet at plus four hundred. Uh, the actual odds are much lower, but how satisfying would it be to not only hear the doink and uh, join us in the Norse Code Discord to uh, laugh about it, but also to the, the very mic'd up doink, by the way. Yeah, yeah, the thunderous doink. Yeah. Uh, but how nice would it be to quadruple up your German Jesties along with yeah, all I, that? I think, I think, yeah. There are a couple of bets in here that are just like this isn't this isn't smart money; it's fun money. Um, and and this is entirely within that realm. I think there's a couple more, but like this one is is entirely on brand just like the other podcast i'm on we had to do a kyle use uh prop just because that's what we've been doing um we 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 have to do a doink prop here on norse code we're obligated to morally i think we'd have to cancel the show if we didn't frankly yeah it's, it's in the charter um somewhere so somewhere you'll look it up long time listeners now the last game related prop that i've got is uh, under four and a half total sacks at uh, minus 130 for the game, which I think, uh, again, Mahomes possibly the best at avoiding sacks and uh, San Francisco's offensive line, notably stout. I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of penetration on uh, either side. Yeah, I've also got, so preview for one of my props, I've got Nick Bosa under uh, 0.5 sacks. Um, Same reason, Patrick Mahomes is... Uh, one of the best in history at sack avoidance. Like, um, you know, like I think historically it's like uh, relative to the rest of the league, Patrick Mahomes is in the same conversation in sack avoidance as Peyton Manning, Dan Marino. And like, strangely enough, Joe Namath is in that conversation, which I don't think a lot of people would have expected, but dude was good at avoiding sacks. Um, So like, I think that is, is in there. Uh, um, yeah, two sack avoidant quarterbacks. I think that uh, Purdy has an above average sack avoidance rate. Right? Patrick Mahomes, I think, is second in the NFL this year in sack avoidance, but career wise has been one of the best sack avoidant quarterbacks um, that we've ever seen. I think that that's up there. I think also uh, the the second thing that I think is crucial here is that the Chiefs, when they rush four, don't tend to get a lot of pressure. They're, they're a team that gets more relative to the rest of the league. They're a team that gets a lot more pressure from blitzing. And when you take a look at how Brock Purdy takes the sacks, they are they come from uh, rush four. They don't come from blitzes. And so if you take a look at how the Chiefs generate pressure, how those sacks come about, and how San Francisco takes those sacks, it's a bad matchup in terms of total sacks. So I, I love 
uh, the under on the sack total here. I, I just think that there's a lot of things pointing in that direction for this. Well, that was uh, that was fine and dandy, but uh, what color is the Gatorade going to be? That's the real question. So what's interesting here is I don't know where James or you grabbed the odds on the Gatorade, um, but they're like different odds than where we were looking at the at the football party earlier today. Um, the uh, orange was the heavy favorite when uh, when when the football party was looking it up at um, like plus three hundred, and here orange is plus five hundred, and to me. Orange is the pick. I think the Chiefs have historically used orange in Super Bowls, so um, you're already giving yourself like a fighting chance just by assuming the Chiefs will win and they'll stick with their tradition. So um, I like orange at plus 500. Holy crap. Yeah, I think it's a funny one because I discovered here I thought for a while that some of my favorite online sports books didn't offer bets in Colorado because they just sucked and didn't want me to have fun. It mm-hmm. turns out that there are other organizations that uh, suck and don't want me to have fun that uh, place limits on the kind of extant game events that you can uh, gamble on. So That's, that's true. I, I was looking for some of these extant game events, like halftime appearances and broadcast uh, incidents, um, on on one of the sports books that I like to frequent, and uh, they were like, "Hey, are you looking for this? Find out why you can't find it." And I clicked, and it's like all of these states ban you or provide limits on uh, how much you can put on things like the coin flip. And I was like, "Oh my god, I what?" Okay, I did not realize that with the legalization of sports betting in some of these states came the illegalization of betting on the national anthem length. Well, and it's funny because not all sports books follow all the same rules, although I do believe that some states are starting to tighten the screws a little bit on this, which is all to say that you should not only shop around for availability of bets, but the best line on the bet you want which in this case, I agree with the reef, is orange. Cool. Yeah, I it just uh, plus orange is like a great all-around flavor, right? Like, is it, you get, Think of this like you're an equipment manager, right? Are you going to put purple Gatorade out there for 50-odd players? No. You, you want to be a crowd pleaser. You want to go with a safe bet. And I think that, that orange, orange and blue are like your safest for everybody Gatorade bets if you're, if you're running the equipment for a football organization, right? It's not, you're not picking your favorite. You're picking the one that's going to draw the fewest objections. So I think orange and blue do that for you. And Chiefs historically have gone with orange. Now, see, I think if I was the equipment manager, I would just force my superior taste on the team in hopes that it improved their but performance. You would, that's why you're not an equipment and manager. And so my, uh, my team would be drinking cucumber Gatorade because it's the best. That, that is such a polarizing, good Lord. <laughs> that is so polarizing. I like cucumber Gatorade a lot for about four sips. And then it is a lo- it's too much after that. But the first four sips are heavenly. And then after that, I'm out. I'm done. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the uh, national anthem uh, bet this year, but only because I didn't really like research it. The... Uh, Line I found was under 90 and a half seconds at minus 128. Um, that feels faster than normal. If I may, I've actually done a bit of research on this of, of all dumb things. Um, yeah, yeah, you got to find a niche. I wanted this to be the um, I wanted this to be the Anthony Kiedis bet of the year. Uh, the uh, Anthony Kiedis lock of the week of the year. Yes. Yeah. The Anthony Kiedis will be shirtless at some times dur- at some time during the performance bet, which we declared our license to print money. And it was free money. It was it the absolute dumbest bet any book has it ever. Took a booked. microsecond for it to cash. Yes. <laughs> the moment he's on stage. <laughs> oh, yep. There it is. Uh, I don't think he even traveled with a shirt, much less had one in the stadium. <laughs> it's very possible they just let him on the plane like that. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So a number of her performances of the anthem have been shorter than this. Oh, so that's, that's why it's at minus 128. That's why there's some action. So she's okay. going to rip through this. All it's right. Very possible. It's quick, but is is so when you say a number, is it 
Like her average is about what three seconds faster. Uh, actually, I forget if it was Deadspin or if it was somebody else had actually posted the times of like five of her more of her most famous ones, and they all clocked in just a little bit short of uh, of what they were posting. So she was averaging oh, wow. below. I I'm gonna I'm gonna go contrarian on this one. I think um, I think she's gonna she's I think she's gonna milk this one because it's it's the Super Bowl, man. Reba Reba don't take no mess. I don't know. I think she might uh, she might just try to do it as quickly as possible how many people praise an efficient national anthem I, that's that's all i'm saying more than you um, think <laughs> although people <laughs> people love the chris stapleton one and that took forever that's what i'm saying nobody nobody likes no, nobody like nobody goes out of the way to be like man that anthem was efficient i we got through our business i'm i'm so pleased that we can get on with the show. I think no the same the people anymore, who would the, praise that are the same people who have refused to watch the Super Bowl because of Taylor Swift. <laughs> like that that Venn diagram is a circle. Like that that's yeah. all that is. So I, I, th- I, I think you hold it for that reason. For there's, the there's a dot outside the circle for the technical director of the broadcast. I, I imagine he would really appreciate. <laughs> they would really appreciate an efficient national anthem it's true yeah it's true <laughs> so if there's if there's ever a broadcast where you're explicitly not allowed to trim an ad it's probably the super bowl i, I do think remember there's like a couple of years ago where they leaked what the rehearsal time was and a bunch of people put action on it based on the rehearsal time I forget what it was it was just a couple of years ago uh and then it turned out that the singer actually just held it for much longer than the rehearsal time so the the under was was getting a ton of action, and then the overcashed. It was just it was fantastic. How much money do you think Reba McIntyre could like steal from sports books if she just had a bunch of cutouts, place bets on a time, and then she just held that note for an extra three? What if she pretended she was like a like an NBA ref and? Uh, <laughs> Just push it over just a little bit. How much money do you think she could rake in total? I mean, there's limits at all these books, but I think that for for these kinds of bets, but I think that there's a pretty penny to be made here. I just think that if like if one of Reba McIntyre's friends cousins goes to uh, like Will Hill and places five thousand dollars on the national anthem, no, fifty thousand dollars on the national anthem, someone's going to be raising some alarms. Someone's going to be like, hey, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what do you know? So you're you're just not thinking big enough. It's not like her actual friends. I'm just talking about like a hundred cutouts. You get you get a hundred people to put a hundred grand on the game. That's ten million dollars. Easy. <laughs> and all you had to do was sing. <laughs> I have no insight on what Usher's uh first song performed is going to be. Uh yeah, is one of the odds on favorites. I'm I can tell you almost certainly that it will not be that. Uh, I think um, I like the odds on burn. Honestly, I have almost no insight as well, but burn just feels you people, right? You people. Oh my God. I forgot. We have a music snob. All right. I, what, what a music got? snob my ass. Uh, it's you are what I don't, don't lie. Okay. I am, but not about usher music. I just <laughs> think that it's going to be oh, the, the song. Oh what my God. Unbelievably snobby thing to say. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> coming from you, Dusty, that's particularly rich. Um, <laughs> that, that just that just that just is proof that you know that there's weight behind these words. Yeah, that uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go with. Oh my God, as the as the opener. Well, you know, why? I, What's the you? You sound so confident in this. Why? I'm, yeah, it's it's the chorus. I think it's a good start, and I think it helps build to something like yeah. But burn doesn't. I don't think burn builds it in, in the same like or like builds like a good like starting block. I feel like oh my god has the uh, has the best possible start. All right, Dusty, note this and make fun of him when it's not true. <laughs> I will note it. I mean, I I this goes back to the thing about narrative setting. It's a narrative that I can absolutely believe, but you know, beware the uh, constructive na- constructed narrative when uh, when placing a sports bet. When they've but, when they've uh, looked at his residency in Vegas, the song that came up was uh, was my way, 
um, not the cover of the Frank Sinatra song, but the song My Way off his like first record. So if you were going off of what he's been doing lately in Vegas, that would be the one to bet on. But that's probably why it's one of the uh, lowest favorites. Yeah. That and yeah, are both plus 225 on BetMGM. I would, the, my, my bet is, uh, is still, oh my God. All right. Well, I've, no, I've noted it in the show notes. I'm going to go with uh, a reef on this one and pick burn uh, just for, out of pure betting strategy purposes. If you're going to throw a couple bucks down on something like this, why not make it one of the longer shots? That way, if you're yeah. right, it you, uh, you can paper over your mistake with some dollars. Uh, I will uh, wager that Usher's total set will be under eight and a half songs. Do you have insight into how long Super Bowl sets are, or is this just like a man? That seems like a long set. It just seems like a long set. I mean, if he does yeah. two minute cuts of each song, that's uh, almost twenty minutes of performance, which is a long time to do anything in a football broadcast without an ad. Uh, it's true. Um, remember, Super Bowl half times are significantly longer than uh, than regular half times. That's something to keep in mind. All right, guest performer. The only the only insight I have on this is that. People have put a lot of act. People must have put a lot of action on Taylor Swift for it to be as low as plus five hundred. There is no way she's the guest performer. Are you kidding me? She wouldn't have had any time at all to rehearse, and we don't even know if she'll make it to the Super Bowl on time. No way is she a guest performer. Plus five hundred is crazy odds. Is there any way I can bet anyone but Taylor Swift? Like, can I do a field bet instead? I. I mean, given I, that it's plus five hundred, one would think that there are like odds on the other side of that. But I don't. I'm imagining that. I assume no, but there's no way. Like, I mean, a, a bunch of books are offering a bunch of books that are um, not limiting themselves from the particular rules, of particular states on what you can bet on. Um, are offering Taylor Swift bets, and I went through three of them, and I didn't see any of them on the Taylor Swift specific section of their of their parlays, which is. Uh, we're a lot we're in that territory um that have offered guest right guest yes no right so i'm imagining no but if you if you see it i think that that is probably a really good shot for you is to if you can find no even at minus whatever like it's it's still probably a good shot for you to get a little bit of extra scratch see i gotta i gotta disagree I do not believe it is possible for Usher to perform the Super Bowl halftime show without Ludacris. I, I mean, I do think that you you can't. That's funny. I do think that you can get uh, some of these other guests um, from a pure vibes perspective. I like Will I Am at, at plus two twenty, um, but I'm going to trust you on Ludacris. I mean, Ludacris is minus two fifty uh, for a reason. Yeah, for for a reason, and. You know, it's it's a suitable hedge. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't betting the farm on on minus two fifty kind of defeats the purpose. And you know, German jesties are for play, not for work. Yeah, <laughs> I like the idea of of Ludacris being on the fifty yard line on a football stadium uh, after his breakout hit. What's your fantasy? But this is just the cleaner version of that. Yep. The circle closes. Perfect. I would feel more excited about a Scorigami if the Lions had made it to the Super Bowl, but I don't think we're going to see enough shenanigans to warrant an entirely unique score. Uh, this is a for fun bet, not a for odds bet for me. I would place it just because I want to be able to cheer for a Scorigami and be rewarded if I'm correct. That's all <laughs> it is. And hit a 28 to 1 when it lands. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's fun, you know. Hitting a 28 to 1, right. yes. It's extremely fun. That's yeah. how people get addicted to gambling. <laughs> not, not that I would know. Yeah, I mean, who's to say, right? Who's, who's to say, really? Yeah. Uh, then we've got the props that I set up for a little bit. So a couple of these I went over on the other podcast, but I like Chiefs plus 2.5. I think a lot of people are taking Chiefs money line. Um, this is like an interesting one, right, because uh, the Chiefs are quote-unquote underdogs, and there's been a lot of action on the Chiefs. Um, but the line hasn't moved actually like they opened at like plus two and a half. And so um, it's interesting that the line hasn't moved, but people are taking a bunch of action on it. So I wonder if there's like some sharp money on the 49ers. I don't really care. Uh, Purdy has not played very well in the playoffs. Uh, Mahomes has 
Normally, I wouldn't take small samples like the playoffs as my total for the data. But I do think that uh, the Chiefs are in the Patriots territory of just messing around during the regular season and then actually paying attention during the playoffs. Like, I think that's where we're at. So I like that. Um, McCaffrey gets 35 plus yards each half. I think that the Chiefs rush defense is just so catastrophically worse than its past defense. It's not like awful, but it is significantly worse than its past defense that they're going to invite the run. And I think that this is going to be fine. Everyone was making fun of the Ravens for not running the ball. They were right. So I think, I think McCaffrey 35 plus yards in each half. Um, already talked about Nick Bosa under 0.5 sacks, uh, Brock pretty passing yards under 246.5. Same reason. I think they want to run the ball. Um, all, this was like for Purdy, but also I'm just going to get rid of that one. Um, I already talked about anytime Kyle Yushik plus 900. That one's just fun. Uh, the score got me one. You found a better line for it than I did. So uh, take the plus 2,800, not the plus 2,500. Um, I like that there is a bet on the fastest next gen stats ball carrier. That's funny that they have that. Um, so I want it and I want to give it to the guy who has the best testing not the guy who is probably going to be the one that runs the fastest with the ball or the guy who has a lot of opportunities to hit the top mark on running fast with the ball. Um, I want to give it to the guy I like who is fast, who's not Marquez Valdez-Scantling, but Justin Watson. The Chiefs do like him. They do they do target him a surprising amount in games, and uh, he's got a ton of speed, and he's plus 1040, which is the real reason that I want to take this because I like those odds. Um I like Chiefs score more in the second half and overtime than they do in the first half. Uh, over the course of the season, they've been kind of a slow starting team, uh, and they've had to to bring it back. So I, I kind of like that. That's minus 115. And then there's a bunch of Taylor Swift bets. Some of them, uh, if you like, look around on some of these books at the Taylor Swift bets, some of them are like truly like awful. And I mean like, oh my God, I totally forgot that like gamblers have a reputation for being awful people until I saw these again, right? Like, like who is topless first, Jason Kelsey or Taylor Swift? It's like Jesus Christ, relax, right? Um, so none of those. But will Taylor Swift wear an outfit made by Kyle Yushik's wife? I don't think she will. But at plus four fifty, I do like the odds that she will. But yeah, so her outfit choices will have been mostly curated, and uh, she'll pick from her favorites. But like those those choices were made for other reasons long ago. And although it would be cute, I, I, I mean, don't that's know how just throwing long, away money. So here's the thing. I think normally I would agree with you. I don't know how long ago those choices were made because of how whirlwind of this romance was and how difficult it was to schedule um, her getting to the Super Bowl. I think that, that it was – I'm not going to say haphazard. Certainly they'll have a plan, right? They've had a couple of weeks, but not long ago. Um, okay, fine. So like yesterday. <laughs> yeah. I – I agree that the odds of her wearing a uh, Christian Yushchik original are going to be somewhat low. But here's the thing. The NFL has struck a deal with Christian Yushchik on these uh, on these dresses, right? The NFL has had a huge problem selling its merchandise for women because they do a very poor job of designing their gear for women. Like if you if you look at people talk about NFL marketing towards women, um, you, you see a ton of women complain about the offerings that the NFL shop has. Um, and I think that having that deal with Christian Juszczyk to design all of this stuff in NFL gear in ways that are appealing and fashionable um, is, is huge. They just struck that deal. Um, I think that part of that curation process could possibly, again, the odds are low, could possibly include having Taylor Swift once again, because she has won it, won it before, which is a mark against it. But once again, now in an officially licensed and branded capacity, wearing this stuff. So that's why I like it at plus 450, is that there is a marketing push behind this in a way that allows the NFL to capture a problem that they try to solve, right? And so that's why I like it at plus 450. So that's my argument. I mean, that's fair. I just think it's... Uh like a less than five to one chance. So I'll be, right, I'll be skipping that one, but you know, you do you boo. Sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's it. That's another one. I'm just going to mark down and then make fun of myself most likely when it doesn't hit. Um, so Swift and Travis Kelsey to be shown kissing on February 11th. Um, so the way it's, the reason it's worded like that is because the book I grabbed it from has on CBS broadcast, which excludes uh, the halftime, the pregame, the postgame. 
and then on February 11th in a live capacity on any type of broadcast. And I think that uh, after the game, them kissing is uh, is is a is a pretty likely ish scenario. Um, so I like that one at minus one eighty. Um, well, because it doesn't have to be a kiss from that day, right? Like it can be like just. I think I think it has roll of them. Does it have to be that like live video of them kissing? It can't just so, be like. So when B-roll? I when I when I scrolled over the information on the bet, it did not say live. My brain feels like it should be live, but the reason I liked it is because the explanation of the bet did not say it had to be live. I like it much better in that case. Yes. Yeah. So it's minus one eighty. Yeah. Um, so then there's Donna, Col- uh, Donna Kelsey hugging Taylor Swift on the CBS broadcast. I have that yes, minus 120. Those are relatively even odds. Obviously, the most likely scenario is if Travis Kelsey scores. He is not, um, you know, the uh, in odds on favorite for an anytime touchdown. He's not minus anything on anytime touchdown. So this is dangerous, but it does happen after first downs as well. So um, I think that that's there's something I like about that. Uh, I like Taylor it too. Swift. I think that's good. I think that there's a lot of value there. Yeah. Uh, Taylor Swift holding a drink during live shot. Yes. This is my brain tricking me. I remember her doing it at least once. So I'm taking it a plus 120. Can um, you parlay that with her hugging Donna Kelsey at the same time? Will she be holding a drink while she hugs Travis Kelsey's mom? That would be awesome. I think any parlay is just going to be like, do these two events happen? I did not see any book offering a combined version of that which would be nice um and then times taylor swift shown during broadcast in live shots i have under five and a half uh because five and a half is crazy to me um there's one game where it was four and then the rest of the games have been two or mostly one live shot uh, and again this is during broadcast so does it this excludes halftime it excludes pregame I believe it excludes the yeah it excludes the national anthem and it excludes post game so during the game, five and a half is insane. Easy. That's a lot. That's once a quarter. And the, and each shot is typically one to three seconds. So like, think think of that. That would, You'd be looking at 12 to 15 seconds of Taylor Swift during the entire broadcast, which, you know, when you say it like that, doesn't really feel like much. But it is so much Taylor it's, Swift. It's pretty valuable screen time, especially with the Super Bowl. It is so much. It is so much Taylor Swift that it has already driven uh, apparently billions of people to performatively billions. refuse to watch the Super Bowl. Yeah, billions must turn off the television. Billions of televisions turning off in disgust. Uh, no, I think the under is the smart play on that as well. All right. Uh, so I think with that, we're done with the um, – the Super Bowl prop bets. Uh, unfortunately, Dusty, I believe, works a real job or something along those lines uh, and must depart. Well, you know, uh, I am of two minds on this. Uh, on the one hand, I got to say, this has been an exhausting ordeal. And uh, exhausting, on the other hand, he says, I will. <laughs> it's the most I've ever worked, actually. Uh, I, you know what? I'd believe that, actually. I've seen you work. <laughs> Why are, are you looking at me now? Like what? <laughs> That's very strange. There's a lot of noise um, coming from the basement I don't have right now. So I just want to point that out. Noises I'm not making in the basement you don't have. Exactly. Uh, yeah, correct. That's the that's the sound or that's the uh, the name of our uh, folk album. Yes, thank you. That, be, that was act, that, next year. That was the direction I was about to jump to. So kudos. Well, uh, having said all that, uh, let's do it again next year. I'll uh, be counting my Germagestes in the meantime. Well, good luck, Dusty, and we will uh, we will talk to you later. All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Take care. Yep. Yeah, you too, man. Well, let's go over to the mailbag, and the first question I've got for you is from. Let's see. There we go. I almost lost it. Uh, Osman asks, if the Vikings extend Jefferson, can they structure the contract to where the biggest cap hits are his first two years? So they can have more cap space when hopefully they're actually competing at the high, at a high level again. Uh, I mean, yeah, um, you can structure it however you want. You can front load a contract. In fact, I used to think that was the thing to do in Madden when I was like playing Madden 08. I was like, hey, man, 
Um, you're always structuring these contracts to hit you later, and then you have to make some tough choices. I hate that. I'm gonna I'm gonna front load these contracts so that I always have, you know, down the line. So I'm gonna build the team I want to build, and then down the line I'm gonna have a bunch of cap room to work with. And if I'm always front loading, it's gonna feel like a gift every every year when the cap hit actually goes down instead of up. Um, I thought that it, it turns out that actually doesn't make any sense at all. That's stupid. You're not signing enough players that way. Uh, I'm not saying your specific suggestion is stupid. I'm saying overall front loading a bunch of contracts is stupid. Um, the reason the Vikings wouldn't do that is a, they, they think they're always going to be competitive. So that's not going to happen. But B um, the cap, if you treat the cap like your cash reserves and uh, your cap hits as like cash liabilities, um, these operate as essentially like pushing the can down the road operates as a negative interest loan. So having an expanding cap hit against an expanding cap makes sense in a ton of different ways. And it also gives you flexibility, right? If you like front load your contracts, um, you're not going to be able to, if you've got a cap crisis in those first two years, do very much, right? If you need to make an emergency move, there's like not a ton that you can do because you're already taking the cap hit for that year. The money's already been guaranteed and paid out, right? Um, so you can restructure the next year, but not the year that you're in in order to create that room. And it's just, it's really tough, right? But if you extend it out into the future, you've got a lot more opportunities to kind of move stuff around, add void years and stuff like that because you haven't paid out that money yet. And so you can convert a guaranteed base salary into a signing bonus, right? So um, that's one, that's one, reason but just generally speaking it is you know if if the thing is growing at seven percent a year why wouldn't you want your cap hit to grow at seven percent a year like i know that the idea is to have a low cap hit when you're hitting your quote-unquote window but planning around windows historically in the nfl has been really difficult to work around like you do need to know where your team is at i don't think the vikings are are a bad team like a lot of people have been talking about the vikings like they're a bad team they went like seven and 10 or whatever. I forgot what the record was this year. I always forget. Um, but they had like seven wins this year with four different quarterbacks. That's crazy. I I think the team is pretty good. I don't think you got to wait for your windows. Like I know there's a quarterback question, right? And that's going to control a lot of things. But I think the team is pretty good. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I wouldn't build around windows. Uh, Todd Alexander asks, What's the feeling on a new hire for defensive line coach since Chris, uh, since Chris Rumpf went on to Clemson? Uh, would Terrell Williams be a candidate? Um, yeah, I, I, I wonder what the Vikings are doing about that. I wonder if they had any conversations during the Senior Bowl approaching somebody about being a defensive line coach. Now, one issue is if you're, if you're hiring a defensive coordinator, you can ask any other team or not any other team. You can, under the current NFL rules, ask any position coach to interview with you, right? Like that's the thing that you can do and, and no team can block that interview, right? Um, so that's like, that's the deal, right? Is that you, you've you got a lot of options if you're a defensive coordinator, if you need a defensive coordinator, if you need an offensive coordinator, you can get a position coach from another, um, another position or another team and, you know, make something of it, right? That you've got an opportunity um, to, uh, to, you know, add a guy and, and you'll be good. But you can't do that with a position coach from another team. Teams can block you. They will block you. Um, now, I don't know why Terrell Williams was brought up. Uh, my understanding is that he was recently hired by the Detroit Lions um, to be their defensive line coach. Uh, and so I think that this question is probably just submitted before that happened. Um, so unfortunately, no, but he would have been an interesting grab after after having been the defensive, lines co uh, defensive line coach for the Tennessee Titans for a number of years. Um, I think that they'll probably, you know, shuffle some stuff around internally, but I'm guessing they had conversations at the senior bowl with people who could be defensive line coaches or they could hire someone from college. But Forty Terrell Williams is, is, has been taken off the board, uh, in that regard, at least as far as I can tell. Um, but yeah, uh, Chris Rumpf went over to Clemson. So the Vikings are basically a defensive line coach. Also notably, uh, Mike Smith is on staff um, as a, not the former Atlanta Falcons head coach, Mike Smith, but the former Packers pass rush specialist, Mike Smith, is also the Vikings pass rush coach. To me, I, yeah, that's an outside linebacker coaching position. To me, I think that you can transition that pretty, maybe not easily, but relatively easily into defensive line coach. So you may not have to hire anybody. 
Next question is from Zach Dixon, who asks, for a Reef's Karma Corner, did we cover the karmic debt that was accrued in the 2022 season with the 2023 season? If so, do we carry excess karma into 2024 or is it neutral? Yeah. Um, so I like this question uh, because it allows me to introduce the concept that uh, good karma costs more than an equivalent amount of bad karma gives you. Um if you're a Vikings fan, um, I think for normal people, good karma, bad karma, if you believe in karma, that just like balances out, right? Like uh, you make a dollar, it costs a dollar, right? Fine. Um, for the Vikings, every amount of good luck that they get is paid back fourfold. Um, the Vikings do not have many charmed seasons. When they do have charmed seasons, it hurts for a while is the deal. That's the deal that you sign. So um, and I don't want to I don't want to I want to be clear. I'm not backtracking on the fact that it, when we discuss magic on the show, that I don't believe you can borrow uh, from from future magic uh, magical debts in the same way. But karma is a different concept, um, and I think here the karmic issue for the Vikings they're going to persist for a couple of years to make up for the for the 2022 season. I think that that's uh, more likely what's going to happen. It's historically happened, right? 2017. Uh, 2009, etc. I think that when you have charmed seasons, the Vikings pay for it for several years. Also from Zach, uh, or rather from uh, from a Hyundai for one of us, is a Hyundai for all of us. Asks, I think my biggest concern from last year is a Kevin O'Connor, a Kevin O'Connell wants to hammer a quarterback into his system, independent of fit. Do you think this is a fair assessment of the Q, of the quarterback carousel this year, and any history to quell that concern? Uh, there's not a lot of history we have with Kevin O'Connell working with multiple types of quarterbacks that allows us to really dig deep on this question. But I think that he did use all four quarterbacks in different ways. I don't think that he did a wonderful job of 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 working within that, of finding all of the different ways that you can maximize somebody like a Joshua Dobbs versus Nick Mullins. But they were used in different ways. They had different passing depths. They had different um, – amounts of play action. They're different types of play action. So there's shotgun play action where you keep your torsos towards the torso torso towards the line of scrimmage. And then there's a traditional play action where you turn your back to the line of scrimmage. There's the rollout play action. Um, there's the play action inside of the pocket. Like these are all different, right? And different quarterbacks got different treatments in that regard in terms of the amount and the type. Um, the depths, the route concepts that they ran, those were all different. I think primarily he was constrained not by his desire to fit a quarterback in a system, but essentially a coaching requirement that he calls plays that the other 10 players in that offense are familiar with. You don't get to have a new training camp for every starting quarterback. The training camp that you had is the one, it's the, it may not be the one you like to have, but it's the one you're going to war with, right? Wow. That's the playbook that most of the players know. It's the plays they know how to execute. It's the checks that they understand. Um, and there's only so much drilling and repping you can do during the week to install new stuff. You're mostly calling back to old stuff and base concepts that you're working off of. Um, and so that's the constraint. The quarterbacks have to fit what the rest of the offense knows. Um, that's the thing. So I don't think it's a Kevin O'Connell stubbornness thing. I think it's a ye gods. We have to figure out how to make the rest of the players operate in this offense as well as this new guy thing. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's anything like a lack of flexibility. I think that he tried to be as flexible as he could be given his constraints. I have some criticisms to his approach uh, in that flexibility, but I do think that um, he did attempt to be flexible for sure. Uh, Dorkamundo asks, there's a lot of talk on uh, on Minnesota Vikings Reddit about Russell Wilson joining for a one-year veteran minimum deal. Any chance you and Arif could possibly discuss this on the next pod? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills with how many people believe he's just going to take some kind of low-ball deal just because of the offset language, and it's just going to continue to get worse as we approach as uh, we approach free agency. Ultimately, I'm curious if you all are familiar enough with the offset language to determine if it only applies to salary or if it would apply to bonuses as well, as the language suggests it's only salary. It only applies to salary. Uh, well, it applies to guaranteed money, I should I should be clear. Um, so let me take a super quick look at Russell Wilson's uh, guaranteed because that's what's going to matter here. So um, it doesn't apply to likely to be earned incentives. So we've talked in the show before about the difference between likely to be earned and unlikely to be earned incentives. They matter for cap accounting, but they're not money that's paid out yet. So um, 
if uh, the Broncos were to cut Russell Wilson um, if for the 2024 season, he has $17 million in guaranteed salary that he is accountable for um, or that the, that the Broncos are accountable for, right? But the Broncos will carry an $85 million cap hit. That does not mean that the next team that signs Russell Wilson um, will discount $85 million off of what the Broncos have to pay. So for people unfamiliar with offset language, it's basically this. Um, we're going to guarantee your salary. This was like a huge deal. A lot of people learned about offset language um, after the first CBA when rookies were negotiating um, about uh, about offset language because people were like, why are there rookie holdouts when there's a there's a slotted amount of money they can make? Well, it's because of guarantees and offset language. So um, let's say you sign a player to a two-year, $10 million a year contract. It is fully guaranteed $10 million the first year, $10 million the second year. Um, after that first year, that player has been really disappointing. It sucks. You hate it. You cut that player, right? So you owe that player $10 million in future salary. It's fully guaranteed, right? Well, if that player signed with another team for $4 million, then you only have to pay the difference. You only have to pay that player $6 million. That player is not seeing any new money from that, right? So uh, that's what offset is, is that you only pay the difference. And I believe it's the difference in the first year of the deal, um, I want to say. Um, so, and, and it depends on how the offset is structured. But the offset is only for guaranteed salary. It's not for bonuses. Um, it's not for any. So the, the signing bonus for Russell Wilson has already been paid out to him. He has that money in his bank account. It is not future money the Broncos owe him. It is just an accounting of how much money under the cap the Broncos are required to take on. Um, so uh, he could earn more than $17 million on the quarterback market because he's a quarterback. Like I, I would, I might rather have him than Daniel Jones at $40 million, right? And I don't want him at $40 million, but I think that he could get like 30 million odd dollars on the market. Why would he take a veteran minimum's salary at one million because he knows he's going to get seventeen million either way when he could take thirty and just take the full thirty, right? Yeah, I mean it's not about whether or not the Broncos get to not have to pay the seventeen million or whatever, right? It's it's about what maximizes his income. Maybe it's a one year deal, and maybe he wants to sign a prove it somewhere so that he can build a bigger contract. Um, for himself later on. I don't know kind of the way that he wants to approach this market, whether it's betting on himself for a short-term deal or trying to generate some long-term security. No idea. But I do think that he'll get a market and I do think he'll have an opportunity for a multi-year deal. And if that's the case, none of this offset stuff is going to matter. He's just going to try to find the best deal. So that actually does not make sense to me. I think that people are focusing too much on offsets. If someone has different information on offsets, please let me know. We'll correct ourselves I'm going to say on the next episode, but that could be like two weeks from now. But, you know, that's when we'll correct ourselves. Yeah. So, But I'm reasonably confident about this, that the offset language stuff is not going to give you – it's not going to give the Broncos like an $84 million discount or anything like that and that it's not going to change his money situation. It is um, the $17 million that's offset. That's it. Let's go to Kenneth Allen who asks – Everyone else seems to have bought into love with a few commentators even calling him a top five quarterback. Where do you stand on him now as compared to your skepticism earlier this season? Is he a legitimately good quarterback and a long-term starter, or did he just get lucky? And are the Vikings the NFC North team with the least amount of reason for optimism? The Packers might have a quarterback and manage to fire Joe Barry. The Lions look great, and the Bears have two top ten picks and trade bait. Meanwhile, the Vikings have no quarterbacks and a mediocre roster. So I was looking at um, the indicators of stable quarterback play and the indicators of unstable quarterback play earlier today, um, which uh, I'm very happy to do that because it revealed to me, um, much like a uh, an angel from heaven, the Jordan Love takes that I need. I'm going to write them up, though. Um Jordan Love's play in unstable situations has been phenomenal. This is stuff like performance under pressure. This is stuff like performance on third down. This is stuff like performance on play action. 
Um, this is stuff like the percentage of plays that are positively graded versus uh, negatively graded. Those are unstable metrics. And he is in unstable metrics, 70 percentile or higher in all of the unstable metrics, except for play action grade where he's 57th percentile. So that's where he's getting the bulk of his value from the season. Uh, in unstable metrics, he is 64th percentile or lower in all of them except one, which is sack rate, which that's extremely stable. So that's probably going to be the case for him is that he's not going to take a lot of sacks going forward. Um, but in one of the most stable measures of quarterback play that we have, uh, the ability to avoid negative plays, he is in the 33rd percentile. Is a really high rate of negative plays compared to other starting quarterbacks. That is more stable than the percentage of positively graded plays. That's just the way that that historically has worked out. You can control your ability to make mistakes. It's really difficult to create um, new opportunities and do something beyond the ordinary. It is really better to do something um, better than mediocre. It is like that's just a more consistent approach to quarterbacking in the NFL. His clean pocket grade is in the 60th percentile. So people talk about that a lot as a stable measure of quarterback play versus under pressure. Every clean pocket looks the same. Every under pressure pocket looks different, right? Um, so I believe a paraphrase of a sociologist about families. Um, but that's, it's really difficult, right? His, uh, his first and second down grade on just first and second down, which are much more stable indicators of play. Anybody who followed the Carson Wentz uh, discourse uh, during his MVP season and a season after that is familiar with this. Carson Wentz got almost all of his value on third down. The Eagles were the best third down team in the NFL that year in 2017. Um, that's really unstable. He is a 40th percentile on first and second down grade. Um, so he put together some really awesome highlights with some really fantastic tools in ways that suggest that this is a guy who's got a lot of talent. He's got it, right? And when we look at some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, we see them do some of the same stuff. We see Josh Allen performing really well under pressure and hitting these really tight window throws and generating positive play after positive play. We see Patrick Mahomes doing that too. But the thing that like separates those guys from like your um, bad year Matthew Stafford's or your any year Jameis Winston's or whatever – your Ryan Fitzpatrick is the ability to avoid the negative plays. And Jordan Love has not demonstrated an ability to do that. Now he is playing better than I thought he would um, midway through the season. These are better numbers than I would have expected from him after the midpoint of the season. But these don't indicate anything that suggests that he is in a really good spot uh, going forward. Um, so we are in Carson Wentz watch for Jordan Love. Uh, and we have to be because um, the only quarterback tick I've ever been wrong about is Josh Allen. The rest, I just haven't been right yet. That's <laughs> that's the important thing to remember. Just waiting for the wave to crest. That's all you're doing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Damian Barrett asks, how different would Diggs's career have been if he had just remained a Viking? Uh, not that different. I mean, well, he led the NFL in receiving yards first two years. Uh, well, not one of the first two years that he has traded to the Bills, right? Um, he's a really astounding receiver. He was very, very briefly in the conversation for best receiver in the NFL. But, you know, he's, he's a high-level guy. He's not A.J. Brown. He's not Justin Jefferson. He's not Tyreek Hill. Um, you know, he's – or Jamar Chase, right? Like, he's a very good receiver just outside of that conversation. Uh, perhaps the way that Lions fans talk about Amon Ross St. Brown, just to bring up some old discourse from the show as well as some new discourse – from Twitter. I don't know if you saw that, James, about the Woodward One sports radio host. Not Woodward One, just Woodward Sports Radio. Just did you see this? I did not. That Amon Ross St. Brown is a better receiver oh, than that. Jefferson. Yes, I did see that bit of ridiculousness. That was funny. I didn't engage with it on Twitter because it was just like because there's like a lot of things where I am not moved by the argument, hey, don't quote tweet that. You're just you're just expanding their audience and that's what they want. I'm not really moved by that argument a lot especially because most of the people that I'm quote tweeting don't have a ton of followers and are not very clearly engagement baiting. They're actually dumb. Um, or I'm dumb and I just can't see it. It's the same framework for me either way, right? Um, but uh, in this case, this is very much a take designed for eyeballs and it's so obviously wrong. It's like very silly for me to dunk on it. And um, I, 
I treat that a little bit different than Peter Bukowski's takes that feel kind of similar. Uh, because I do think that behind it, Bukowski is attempting to make an argument that you can kind of see where it comes from and you can engage with it on that level. I often don't. I usually just make fun of him, but you get where it's coming from, right? With this, uh, it's insane. Like the argument is essentially um, Amon Ross St. Brown cannot run Justin Jefferson's routes, but Justin Jefferson can't run Amon Ross St. Brown's routes. And the difference by which that is true is greater in favor of Amon Ross St. Brown or something, right? And it's like, that's like just definitively not true that's crazy i uh, i don't think there's a route jefferson can't run like that for, that's the weird premise anyway i don't have to engage with it anymore but um yeah i think we're in that spot where so the reason i brought him up is because it's like maybe we would think of Diggs that way it's like this high level receiver that maybe is not getting the respect he deserves or is in that conversation to be a top eight guy or whatever but he's not an elite guy. I don't think that would change with the Bills or with the Vikings. Um, maybe he gets sick of his quarterback a little bit faster with the Vikings than, you know, evidently, I guess he's sick of Josh. I'm not following that. That to me is like tabloid stuff at this point. Um, I'm like, ah, he's tweeted something else. That's fine. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that it would have been substantially different. I mean, look, if he is going to be on the Vikings, he would just have his three dates in one hotel um, happening in Minnesota as opposed to in Buffalo. Right, exactly. Famously. Do not let your uh, <laughs> yeah. sister date him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Every single one. Uh, Raul asks an interesting question. Uh, regarding Dan Campbell's sometimes baffling fourth down decisions. He says, uh, what field goal point value would make for the most compelling fourth down decisions? Three points, four points, or five points? Uh, so like, three points. And the reason that's true is because the reason, one of the reasons the NFL is so interesting is because a field goal is worth just less than half of a touchdown. I mean, obviously a touchdown is actually worth six, but you know what I mean, right? It's the expected points on a touchdown is 6.93, right? It's seven points. Um, that's why it's interesting, right? Is that field goals are just a little bit outside half of that. And the math can't like work out in the way that it does for field goals to be treated the way they are. If field goals were worth four points, insane leverage for, for poor red zone teams, insane leverage, because now two field goals are worth more than a touchdown. That is nuts, right? Like, the reason it feels like momentum, whether or not you believe in it, the whole point of momentum is a feeling, right? The reason it feels like momentum is fading in games where you're kicking field goals is because you can never really catch up to a team that's occasionally scoring a touchdown. And even with a one point change, that's a huge dramatic difference, right? Because you score two field goals and you're still behind, you have two scoring drives, you're still behind that's that sucks that feels bad right and now they just have to match you field goal for field goal right like that's it's because it's worth less than half a touchdown that i think field goals are so interesting so i wouldn't change that i have tweeted out or i've put on this podcast to take that like it'd be kind of cool if field goals were worth more by their distance right like hot take field goals should be worth the yardage divided by 10 or whatever um and i still love the idea the problem is like that only rules in a situation where no one changes their strategy with knowledge of that information, right? Otherwise, you would just stop at like the 35 yard line and kick a field goal, right? Like that's everyone would be kicking field goals. No one would be trying to get touchdowns. Are you kidding me? Um, like that's the problem is that the knock on effect of that is that it kind of ruins the game. But in the abstract, I really like rewarding teams for being able to make more difficult kicks, right? But in the reality, the reason the game works so well is because field goals are worth what they are. The next question is from uh, Chris, who asks, is Kyle Sloter's Twitter a bit that he's playing, or is he a true believer in what he's saying about PFF? Uh, I, I think he's a true believer, not just in what he's saying about PFF, some of the other stuff. He recently retweeted a uh, Stephen A. Smith take that's going around, especially in conservative Twitter. We don't have to go into it. Um, but I, th I think he thinks that. <laughs> I think he thinks the thing. Um, so uh, I, I think that so so the the PFF one so so an aggregator 
that there are good aggregators out there. I promise. I have been very mad at aggregators recently. Um, Jasper Football, Dove Climbing, ML Football. I don't like any of those guys. Um, Ari Myrov is a lot better, I think. Um, uh, this this one uh, Twitter account that I've been following for a little bit, I was actually able to meet one of the people who was running it. Um, 32 beat writers. They handle it a lot more responsibly. They very quickly credit um, where they found a story, what the story is, and they accurately describe the story without sensationalizing it um, in ways that's like respectful of the language the original writer was attempting to use without cutting out context, right? So one of those that I don't like tweeted out um, that Quasi Dofomenta uses PFF to help select which player he wa- which players he wants on his team. That was so it's news. Quasi Dofomenta uses PFF to help select which player he wants on his team. That's the tweet, right? They qu- and then they quote from Matthew Collar's book, which they don't link to. They just say via Matthew Collar. They don't link to the book, right? Which I do recommend the book. It's very good. Um, uh, quote: I use Pro Football Focus to teach myself things that, frankly, I didn't know. PFF really allows somebody to go deep and study that for themselves. That is way different than the headline of that tweet. Way different. Quizzy Dofomenza is not selecting the best PFF grade for receivers or whatever, right? He wouldn't have selected Ed Ingram then, right? And Ed Ingram is turning into a pretty standard guard. There's not a shot at the Ed Ingram selection, which is turning out to be better than I thought it was, right? He wouldn't have selected that guy. He had, he had a mediocre, compared to the draftable guards in that draft, right? He had a mediocre PFF grade, right? He, I don't think he would have selected Kellen, or he didn't select Kellen Mond. Um, but I don't think that he would have selected half the players that he did select, like Jaquel and Roy, if it was based off of PFF grade, which is what this is suggesting. Um, uh, that This sentence is technically not false, right? And that's what a lot of aggregators get away with is that the sentence is not technically false, right? Uses PFF to help select which players he wants on his team. That is technically true. But the way that people will interpret that sentence is trying to find the best PFF graded players when instead he is suggesting, and again, read the book for the context of this quote, is suggesting that it allows you to find stuff. Like I recently been able to see someone use PFF Ultimate. It is a really fantastic tool. You know what it allows you to do? That thing that I was talking about with Jordan Love um, where it's like, hey, on sec- on first and second down, he's not doing that well. What PFF Ultimate allows you to do is it allows you to say, hey, I only want to look at the first and second down passing plays from Jordan Love. I don't want to look at the third down stuff. That's important, but it is unstable. I want to see what's up with this first and second thing, the first and second down thing. And you can you can watch all of those. But hey, what if what if I don't want to deal with pressure? Okay, well, I'll look at clean pocket on first and second down. Okay, well, I don't want the play action stuff. Okay, well, I'll I'll get rid of all the play action on first and second down, and only in the clean pocket. It's like, well, I don't want screens. Okay, I'll watch all the plays, and I'm saying watch, right? I'm not looking at the grade. I'm watching. There is a video for every play. I'll watch all the plays where there isn't a screen, where there is no play action, where it's in a clean pocket, and it's on first or second down, um, and and that'll allow me to get kind of a pure quarterback sense of what this guy is doing, right? It allows you to do that. Um, It has categories for different types of openness for a receiver. So you can have a receiver who's open. You can have a receiver who is quote unquote NFL open, which they categorize as a step. You can have a receiver who's essentially half covered and you can have a receiver who's completely covered, right? Um, You can take a look at quarterbacks based off of how many perfectly covered receivers there are on a play and how they do on that. You can take a look at quarterbacks based off of their first and second read. Um, You can take a look at the analytics that PFF has produced, not grades or statistics, but uh, the findings that they found. They have found, for example, that uh, quarterbacks tend to do better under play action, but how much they do better is variable by year to year, right? Um, Or they have found 
that a receiver, it, generally speaking, is worth more than an offensive tackle. They've also found that the most valuable non-quarterback offensive player last year was Penny Sewell by wins above replacement. So it is not a hard and fast rule, right? And so you can find out a lot of information. It'll also allow you to do scouting. I was talking to Paul Alexander, former offensive line coach for the Cincinnati Bengals and I believe also the Dallas Cowboys, about him using pro football focus to scout. And he said, hey, when I was when I was looking at um, you know upcoming opponents for an offensive tackle, and I was looking at these pass rushers. I found this one pass rusher did really well at home and really poor on the road. And I was like, is that a home road thing? Because that's a really dramatic difference. And then I was able to find out it's a surface thing. He does really well on turf and really poorly on grass. And it's very clear that he relies on his get off, which turf tends to produce faster players, right? That's the kind of the um, one of the characteristics. Um, he re- he needs a faster get off in order for him to be an effective pass rusher. It is a uh, core to what he does. So this week, a lot of the coaching, and we're playing on grass. A lot of the coaching will be playing under the assumption that his primary mechanism of winning is with explosiveness, and so we will overset a little bit, knowing that it's going to be really difficult for him to play to the inside. And when you look at how his offensive linemen have done against that pass rusher, they're dope. They're so good against that pass rusher, right? Um, PFF helps you learn a lot, and you don't have to rely on the grades, right? So um, that's like one thing. But that's not what the aggregator is doing, and that's not what Kyle Sloter got away from it. So he quote tweets this 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 aggregator's tweet, and and he says. If this is true, I can't express how bad of a look this is. Stats and numbers can't possibly tell you everything you need to know about a game that's played with heart and passion. My eyes can tell you who's good better than a number can. I just told you a bunch of stuff that had nothing to do with stats. That is information culled from PFF and especially the product they provide to NFL teams, PFF Ultimate, which allows you to to watch the plays that meet a certain number of conditions. If I want to see how Kansas City blitzes you know, ahead of this week, I can only take a look at their blitz plays on defense, and maybe I only want to look at the third down packages. So I'll only look at their blitzes on third down. And I get to literally physically watch right the actual video tagged to each of those, queued up as a playlist from multiple viewing angles. Like That's an incredible tool to be able to use. It is an instant cut-up generator. They used to spend hours and hours and hours and hours creating cut-ups so that players could watch situational football. Now it's instant with this product, right? Um, Using PFF to improve your football operation is, first of all, a thing now all 32 NFL teams do. They're all customers of PFF, right? It used to be 31 for a while. I don't know who the holdout was, but now it's all 32. Um, But second, learning more about the game from PFF does not mean assuming they know more about football than you. Paul Alexander knows more about football than almost everybody at PFF, if not everybody. But being able to draw your own conclusions based off of using what PFF provides you. And also, they think about things in a different way. And that's useful. It's useful to incorporate a different type of knowledge. So... um, it's not about stats or numbers. Like Quasi is known as an analytics guy, so people just assume the stats or numbers. That's not it, right? Um, so, so yeah, Kyle Slaughter, whatever. That's the that's the that's the deal with him. He also tweeted out that Toby Keith was one of his all time favorite artists. Take from that what you will. Uh, Cody asks a question for Dusty that we're just going to parlay into something slightly different. Uh, asks, as a restaurateur, does Dusty support Panera continuing to serve the lemonade that kills people? Arif, you <laughs> had this this last uh, weekend. What is your review of the uh, of the charged lemonade and uh, your experience uh, so I had of it? it? I had the, the largest size of it. Uh, frankly, I'm disappointed. I'm very much alive. Um uh, which uh, every day is a disappointment, but particularly mm. with the lemonade was an issue. Um, so that was that was concerning. They go way out of their way to tell you about this lemonade. Oh my god! Yeah, you like they, walk in and how many like, hey. signs? Like four. Yeah, we saw like four signs. You walk in and there's a sign that says, "Hey, um, if you want the lemonade that kills you, you can't have it as a fountain drink. You have to get it from behind the counter because you could overfill it if it's a fountain drink. Right? You could just keep on going back." Um, so you, if you want the lemonade that kills you, it has to be over the counter. 
uh, and then you go to to the kiosk to order, and it's like, hey, by the way, you're about to order the lemonade that kills you. It's a kill you type lemonade, so you have to opt in to the lemonade that kills you. It's like, okay, and then there's a sign right next to the kiosk that's like, hey, by the way, this lemonade that kills you can kill you, so just watch out. Um, and then after you order uh, and you walk around the corner, there's another one that's like, hey. You may or may not have ordered the lemonade that kills you. <laughs> if you have ordered it, you can't get it from the fountain. You have to get it from the thing. And also be aware that the lemonade that kills you can kill you. Yes. They, they're like very – they still sell it, which I really respect. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best part as we were – because we went we, – we, uh, we got lunch over at Matt's Bar. And uh, we wanted to catch the movie, but uh, Arif was dragging a little bit. And my suggestion was Me? let's get you the kill you lemonade, the lemonade that kills you. And, yeah, I uh, was I was like out. I was like, man, and I hadn't actually had caffeine all day. And I got the root beer at Mads Bar because of course I did, which doesn't have caffeine in it. So I was like, Ugh. I was dead. So I was like, I got to – in order to get out of this death, I need the death lemonade. Yeah, exactly. So we swung by one on the way to the uh, – on the way to St. Louis Park for the movie and uh, took a couple of pictures, posted the video on Facebook or on, on Twitter and uh, and had a pretty good uh, – had a pretty good laugh with it. Um, By the way, it I, tastes okay. Yeah, that that's the best part. Is that like it? It wasn't good. Like, it wasn't great. Or he f- just like had a sip and went. I feel like the ratio of sweet and sour is wrong. And yeah, like, that was nice. <laughs> this is my first. I was like, <laughs> 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 so yeah, uh, it's like the way it felt like walking in and ordering it. It felt like they were forced by God to sell this lemonade, or forced by a stranger with a gun to sell this lemonade, and they're doing everything they could. So, but no, it's a choice they're making. They're like saying, hey, man, you can not order it or you can order. It. But like the way it's characterized in the store, it's like, Jesus Christ, we are we are required to sell this lemonade, but you are not required to buy it. You understand that, right? You don't have to buy it. We have to sell it. You don't have to buy it. But that's not true. They could just stop selling it. And they don't. And I really respect that. Two yeah. people have died drinking the lemonade and they're like, hey, man, you want more? <laughs> well, you can only get it from behind the counter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have exactly. An odd gape, we have an odd gatekeeper situation, but we're gonna go with it. Uh, not your father's dopamine asks. I'm not gonna name names, but there have been hints that NFL media members don't always do their homework, and that leads to clickbaity level content and discussions. Has Norse Code ever come up to the mic not prepared? Uh, purposefully tonight, I told Arif not to not to research some some of the questions we have. So. There, you know, yeah, I was like, hey, hey, James, I'm not done. Like, I got stuck up on researching this one thing. I'm not done. He's like, great. <laughs> and he just started recording. Yep. That's that's what we were doing. It uh, it worked better for me. Uh, <laughs> Charles writes, asks for Arif, James and Dusty's podcast inversion corner. Do you have any questions for Arif, James and Dusty? Not really. Uh, no, I'm I'm good. I mean, like. Everything I need to know about Dusty, I already know. He's dead and also kidnapped in in James's basement. I can hold both of these thoughts uh, at the same time. I've also been to James's place, um, and I can confirm it definitely has a basement. Don't it, listen to it's, it. Wow, thank you. Um, well, just for that, uh, if you ever you're curious what it's like to ride in a car with a reef. Um, after you record a podcast, you still find yourself doing the bits afterwards. As oh, we that were, sucks! It was so, we couldn't escape. <laughs> after we left the theater, after we somehow found my car, um, <laughs> a thing that was which, which was a, it wasn't like a reference to the fact that my car has been stolen several times. No, but I it did more, say I did say if my car disappeared too, that I was going to raise hell. Yeah, yeah. It was more that uh, we were trying to find a place to park right away, so we took the first open sp- spot. And it was way far away from the theater in another building, I guess. Yeah. You had to, it was a maze. Yeah, so as we're driving away and we see a crumble cookie across the parking lot, <laughs> I point this out to Arif. <laughs> and uh, Arif says, all right, so here's the plan. Uh, we go in there as child, la- as child labor yeah, as we, we, we are inspectors from the Department of Labor. Yes, that that was going to be the play. Yeah. That's how we were going to get free cookies out of them. Yeah, so 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 James was like, oh my God, we're going to like scare them into shutting down. And I was like, no, we're going to get them to bribe us yes. <laughs> as government officials so that we shut up about their child labor by giving us free cookies. And I'm sitting there at like three or four minutes expensive cookies this would have been worth it three or four minutes into this conversation i realized we're not recording 
We're just driving. We just do a bit. I'm just driving. Yeah, we're doing a bit while I'm driving you back to your place so I can go to because I can go Dude. to dinner. Right. So like, James and I are friends, but like the like ninety plus percent of our interactions are on the podcast. Yes. And so our conversation patterns when I'm not just staring at my phone, uh, when my, con- my our conversation patterns are just the podcast conversation patterns at this point. The 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 bits are strong. They, they, too strong. They, they always go back to this. They always go back to the bits. Logan Bolsharif asks question for a reef's desert Island corner. In a previous episode, you said that you'd uh, team up with James so that you two could kill and eat dusty on a, des- on a uh, deserted Island. And if I remember correctly, uh, oh, if I remember correctly, if you were to be stuck on a desert Island with your Minnesota football team, uh, Minnesota football party team, Luke, Luke and Sam, who would you team up with to ensure your own survival? Uh, Inman, obviously. Um, Sam is not a worldly man, nor a survivalist. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to put that one out there. I love Sam. I think he's a really great host. Um, and I, I would not have agreed to do the football party if Sam was not on the show. But but you also think he's delicious. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's simple economics. <laughs> um, it's which guy is the easiest to eat that Sam, right? It's, it's, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta figure out which guy is going to be the hardest to eat, easiest to eat, best to eat. It's simple guy economics, right? You just got to figure out the guy, right? So Sam easy. I also cannot ever team up with Luke Braun. Um, and the concern is that before we even arrive at, a, 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 on a deserted Island, right? Uh, Luke Braun will have schemed his, his Weasley little way into alliances and traps. Right. And so uh, he may be the reason that we're on a desert Island. Right. So, um, that my concern is I have to outmaneuver for him quickly. And I think Luke Inman is the way to do that. Also, I think it's probably the case that Inman is the most athletic out of all of us. So kind of just having him on my side seems like a good play. Well, you did run the 40 last year twice, famously. Yeah, famously, yeah. I, that sounds like a lot of supply side uh, guy economics. Yeah, I know there's, there's a lot of um, – you got to figure out quantity of guys supplied versus quantity of guys demanded. Uh, and you got to figure out how many guys you're getting. There's a, there's a getting side, so that's the supply side guy economics side of it, yeah. Let's go to North Code. Uh, Nolan Kaler uh, asks, what does it say about the CFL that Nathan Rourke made more money than anyone in the league without taking a single NFL snap? Would Arif forego his Canadian hatred to lead the class uprising? I did not realize that Nathan Rourke made more money than the rest of the CFL. I guess it's because he signed a practice wide contract with the Patriots, right? Um good for him. I don't see a reason. This is there. He's still labor, right? There's no class uprising here. That's Nathan Rourke is not a capital owner. He just makes more money. That's the traditional definition of class. Yes. Also, I don't respect Canadians, so I can't really (laughs) see myself engaging in class solidarity in favor of the canadians that's kind of a bridge too far for you i imagine yeah it's it's a lot uh viking jack asks uh, louis Rees zamet the elite 22 year old welsh rugby winger has announced he'll be joining the international pathway program with the nfl could arif using the data available google give us an idea of his athleticism in relation to nfl players obviously speaking completely impartially as a welshman he is going to take the league by storm and could play any position to a super bowl level but which do you think he's most suited to that's a long snapper if i've ever seen one uh this is a extremely handsome person good lord uh, <laughs> is this going to be one of those situations where you dox them on 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 the pod? And... I, he's a public figure, okay. I'm not going to be looking up his address, right? Um, no, you only do that to us. True, I was going to say astrologist. Jeez, James, that's awful. Wow, uh, you only that's, get to do that's that worse than anything I ever did. <laughs> calling calling this space I caught scientist myself. an astrologist. I caught myself. But you also call, you also called that particular listener very uh, particularly handsome. He was. But also, I mean, have you Googled uh, Luis Reese Zamet? I can't Look, say that I have. Well, let's let's do that. I, d- while I dare you. Look. 
So he's a Welsh so, rugby win, uh, winger. Yeah. Uh, so he's 6'3", 194. Uh, I don't know if that's what he's going to weigh in at his pro day. Um, I have not watched any of him. Uh, let's. I'm going to throw on... I'm sure YouTube has highlight tape, right? Um, he shared footage of his training. That's not going to help me. I'm, I'm sure it's just like ladder drills. Um, have you Googled him yet? I have indeed. Handsome. That is a handsome man. Yeah, see? All right, so... We've got one-handed grabs. That's pretty cool. Receiver gloves, though, you know, it's okay. That's actually kind of impressive. Um, but let's say, let's find, uh, okay. This highlight tape is titled Luis Reese Zamet scores bangers only. That's a pretty good name actually, uh, for a highlight reel. Um, so we'll take a look at this and see, cause the last NFL player that was a winger, um, that came from rugby was insanely fast. This guy's pretty fast. Uh, he's got a lot of balance, it looks like. Um, I don't know if there's not a lot of change of direction being demonstrated here. Uh, man, he's fast, though. Let's see if he has to change direction. He's got some cuts. If he's okay, I don't know. So he's pretty tall. I don't think he could be a running back, right? Six. Six three, yeah. So he would have to be a receiver. Um, I don't know. He's got like a stutter, like he's got running back movement style. My concern is that he's a too tall to be a running back, and I think that's what he is. What if um, he's a I think He's going to have to try out to be a receiver. I haven't seen him like cut because rugby is not a sport where you're running laterally a ton. As far as I know, I'm sure someone's going to correct me. What if he's yeah, a gunner? He's, he's a gunner. He's yeah. a punt gunner. He's that that absolutely works for that. Also, for the Norse Code Vermont corner, I'm likely moving from Wales to Vermont with my partner's entire family of nine. Do you Jesus. have any advice for me and how best can I uh, fit in and what do I wear? Uh well, first of all, if you're moving to Vermont from Wales, you're gonna have to stock up on winter clothing. I have experienced what people in the British Isles call winter, and you are not prepared. <laughs> um Vermont was un, unusually warm this last year maybe that'll be the case but um there's gonna be a ton of snow so you're gonna want at least a uh, gear that is relatively waterproof or snowproof um so you're gonna want winter clothes uh there are a lot of families in rural-ish Vermont that are very large um and there's a lot of homes that were once barns to accommodate this fact um, so Vermont is probably not a bad situation for you. Also, it is one of the only states that has anything resembling the healthcare infrastructure that the United Kingdom is purported to have. Kind of depends on what you think of the current changes to the NHS and how you feel about that. But Vermont is something a lot closer to universal healthcare. Um, so that'll help. Uh, Vermonters are weird. Um, that's just that's I don't know how to go through it all, but they are uh, hippies who are very pro guns. Um, that's just the reality of it. They love their gun rights and they love otherwise being lefties. Uh, now, if you're really familiar with online leftist spaces, that's not that unusual. But in real life, it is very unusual. <laughs> like, I want to stress that once you log off, that is actually quite unusual. Um, there was a Doomsday Preppers episode in one of the first two seasons where they encountered, uh, I believe, a pacifist Doomsday Prepper. Uh, and they believe very much in building around their community, building trust around everybody around them. They were very clearly left of center. Most of the preppers are, are to the right. Um, I suggest you find that episode, watch it, and then mentally add guns. And then you're in Vermont. They might have literally actually been in Vermont. And so them not liking guns would have been uh, somewhat unusual, I just, uh, especially rural Vermont. I just like the idea of the pacifist episode, but then you add guns. <laughs> look at the pacifist episode add guns it works <laughs> uh oddly enough we had a second vermont question from a fellow named what? win who asks for a reese vermont fitness corner do you see yourself running the burlington marathon this coming may 
No. Why? Why? Why am I being asked this? I only go to Vermont once a year. Oh hell! Not right. that I dislike going to Vermont, but I don't have occasion to go. Yeah. So this, no. This is this was just being asked. Uh, Dees asks for a Reeves Beast Army corner. Mister <laughs> Beast recently gave someone an unlimited Jesus. amount of money in twenty four hours to build a fortification around a stack of five hundred thousand dollars. Once done, he tried to destroy it, leaving the person with no money. What would your strategy have been to protect the money? Uh, probably rented someone's prepper space. <laughs> now, that, now that my brain is there. Um, yeah, rent an underground nuclear silo. Done. I'm good. I, I don't have to build Jack. It's all built for me. You like there's there's nuclear silos, former nuclear silos that are bought and sold for preppers. I mean, my brain has already been on preppers, so this is just where I'm at. Um, and the reason they're so attractive is because they are very secure. Um, it's hard to get in. So I rent. If you can, if you have to build, right, which I guess is the challenge. Um, I don't like I don't I can't think of myself building something other than standard. Um what what does build mean? Like, can I hire people to be, what? How much of the stuff can I buy? Can I buy a pre-made? What if you did this? Container? What if you took the government's approach to this? And that, it, that's a great start to a sentence. I look that there there may be some logic to this. Uh, what if you took the government's point of view on uh, on this and just were like filthy about like paying off these people so that like you're you're paying for oh. the you're paying for the amount for their work and then there's a kickback a half of that that's also going to go to you after the fact and they get a percentage of it so if you once this whole project is done even if you like lose you still end up with more money than you would have had if you would have been successful at it because you ended up overpaying all of these contractors who were then but contractors are shifty anyway so the idea of like getting the money back is kind of questionable <laughs> but like that being the thing is that you just bribe all these people to get like money back on this i am so lost on your so you come up behind, James? Is that what you're suggesting, intentionally coming up no, behind? No, you have an infinite amount of money to spend on protecting this finite amount right. of money you have. Correct. So you pay, instead of, you know, $10... So out, out, of the, out of the infinite bankroll, you bribe? Is that your argument? Yes. <laughs> you bribe them item. to get, to get <laughs> additional money out of it. So that way you make more than the $500,000 that uh, you would have if and and if he doesn't get it great you still got the five hundred thousand uh, dollars okay i guess i i'm i'm guessing the that the people acquiring the money either include jimmy beast himself in which case he'd just be paying himself um which wouldn't be all that helpful or a bunch of people that you don't like know so you wouldn't be able to go out of your way you only have like 24 hours right so um, I don't think you could spend a lot of time trying to figure out who's trying to acquire. The well, if, if so we have a, if we have an extra, like if we have a real time frame then, or crunch, then that'd be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. That's the 24 hours thing is the thing that trips me up, which is why I'm just like, Hey, just rent a nuclear silo. But like build is like a really interesting question here because I don't know at what, at what point the threshold crosses from building into buying, right? Like if, can you buy a container? Is that different than buying a bunch of sheets of metal? Um, if you buy a container, can it be pre, um, arranged into a living arrangement? Like I, I don't know if you buy the container, can it already be underground? I, what does it mean to build versus buy? What is the threshold? So that's, that's my question, but, um, I can't think of anything particularly creative. Are you able to do it? Are you able to do it? What I'd build over water, like over right where the Titanic is, uh, is, is, is that? I, I get yeah, I guess is is there a geographical restriction? Because do you have to build the boat? I don't know. What if you build a, a better version of that thing that was a, you know, a, a an interesting story last year? Uh, right. Yeah, the submersible. Yeah. yeah How's okay, he going to get from if you, one submersible to another? I don't think that you can build a submersible in twenty four hours. But I like the direction this is going in. You probably can't build a fully functional bathysphere in twenty four hours. But I think that you could build a completely enclosed aquatic structure that you can then rent out a boat to drop you off in the middle of the ocean 
and now you can protect the 500. It's literally impossible to get in. And if they get in, uh, they'll probably do enough damage to the ship where everybody's drowning. So they don't want to get in. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I guess I, I don't know if the transportation is included in the infinite cost in that situation because the security feature is that it's in the ocean. <laughs> this is how are you going to get from one submersible to the other? Oh, by where the Titanic's at? That's 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 well my after, only after the contest is over and if you won the five hundred thousand dollars, presumably James Beast can can, can drag can tow the submersible. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about it. There's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of. See, this is this is how you think outside the box. You just bring it to uh, a fresh, watery grave. Uh, <laughs> right. Buck from the window to the wallert asks for a reefs. James has a migraine corner. Why didn't you even? Why didn't you offer James any caffeine to subdue the pain? Do you even like James? It's been a month. Do you even like me? <laughs> uh, Buck, I I adore you deeply. You're my favorite listener. Have you have you written into the show before? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, second, uh, uh, the reason I did not offer James caffeine is because I like him. Uh, d- do not offer James caffeine. That's that's actually the sign that's on the door. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Please do not feed pet James any caffeine. <laughs> Please do not taunt Happy Fun Ball. That sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, final question is from Adam Bryant, who asks, has Arif been contacted by the beekeepers to become a beekeeper? And has James promised not to take advantage of the old and the weak? Good qu- oh, James, have you have you promised not to take advantage of the old and the weak? I, I always uh, believe in not taking advantage of the old and the weak. Okay, that was not compelling, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I strongly believe in protecting the hive. Uh, a metaphor that I will now beat you over the head with a dozen <laughs> or more times. Um, it society is like a beehive in every respect, except in the ways that it's not. And uh, as a beekeeper who I guess exists outside of society, a thing that outside the law, <laughs> yeah. Um, I and and the law, yeah. The beekeeper exists outside of the society and the law. Uh, I will do everything I can to take care of the hive slash society. It's important that you know it's a society that's also a hive. Yes. Um, We live in a society. I get to make that determination of what it means to take care of the society. Uh, I exist outside of the law and I'm undemocratic and I'm an unstoppable killing machine. And that's a good thing, I guess. That's what I learned from the movie. Uh, Two things about this about this movie. Uh, that I'm going to try not to have too many spoilers on in case you haven't seen it. It is available on Amazon Prime for like 20 bucks if you want to watch it right now before it actually goes bucks. into like what rental a thing. What deal? It's, uh, if, if, I, if I'm going to spend $20 for it, I want to own it. But it uh, it is something you can stream on there. Um, it felt very much, and I don't know, this is going to date me, admittedly, as I say this, but there was a show that existed in the 90s. It was on ABC, and then it was on Fox called The Critic. I was about seven at the time. Yeah. that. that <laughs> wow, Arif. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, uh, I, that that almost completely derailed me, actually. That, <laughs> I want to say I'm a little impressed. Um so there was a show uh, in the 90s back when Arif was roughly seven um, <laughs> that uh, that was called The Critic. And in the show, they had all these movie parodies that would go on. And Al Jean from The Simpsons was like the head person and everything. And John Lovitz was the main voice. And they would do these parodies. And the movie, f- uh, The Beekeeper, felt like one of those parodies. But there was no give on it. There was no like... <laughs> There was no, like, wink at the camera or anything. There was no attempt at, like, making anything that was being said better. All the lines felt like, yep, this is our first take. Moving on. Like, it was was (laughs) absolutely like that. It was remarkable. We're we're on two budgets. One is financial. That's why we're not paying you very much. Yep. Uh, The second is time. Chop, chop. We need to get this thing out because this is clearly Oscar gold. (laughs) <laughs> it was it was absolutely remarkable and afterwards when we were recording our uh uh when we were recording a review i just i, I kept wanting to repeat 
the uh, some of the lines from the movie because they were just so over the top. Like, no human talks like this. <laughs> it was absolutely remarkable. Um, some of the stuff that was coming out of this movie, but yeah, the the Jason Statham uh, Jason Statham thing is real. And uh, to check out our whole review, go over to Patreon and listen to it. It's fantastic. I promise. It's an Arif and James uh, in person recording. What more could you want? We were even being distracted by the people behind us at one point. So it was everything you could want and more. It's perfect. And uh, with that, that is the end of this episode of Norse Code. If you guys have enjoyed it, special thank you to Dusty for joining us. Uh, Arif, what do you have to plug? Uh, so I've got a mock draft coming out by the time most of you will have listened to this. Uh, that's over at Zone Coverage. I also, over at Wide Left, uh, recorded a video with a voiceover of me actually creating the mock draft on um, Fan Speaks on the Clock Simulator, which allows trades, um, or at least the premium version allows trades. And I just kind of talked through my process a little bit. I did speed up the video to about twice speed. So it's not like a real time anything. And I edited out some moments where I had to like leave and like make dinner and the recording was still running, right? Um, but it's like a seven minute video of me kind of talking through the process of why I picked um, or why I, I traded the way I did, um, kind of my thought process and some of the picks. Um, so that video is going to be at wide left, but the article that it's going to be referencing the mock draft and the scouting reports on those players, that'll be over at Zone Coverage. Um, so you can find that there. Uh, we got Luke Braun to hate another quarterback. Uh, I already forgot who it was. I guess he just hates him so much. Uh, it's not Bo Nix, right? I don't know. There's some quarterback he hates. Oh, Drake May. That's it. Uh, that's over at Wide Left 2. That one's about pocket presence. That one's pretty good. Uh, it sounds like Luke is about to do a J.J. McCarthy piece. I'm probably going to very strongly disagree with it. I find it kind of fascinating the way that this discussion is evolving. So that'll be kind of fun. Um but yeah, that's all over at Wide Left. And then I was also recently on the Split Zone Duo podcast to preview the Super Bowl. That was a ton of fun. I had a lot of fun on that podcast. Um, that is behind a paywall. Um, it's either behind the Wide Left paywall, so you could just click over to the Norse Code feed on Wide Left. It's not in the Norse Code RSS feed. It's just on Wide Left, that Norse Code feed there um, behind the paywall or at Split Zone Duo's paywall. You can listen to that there. Um, I had a bunch of fun on that. So. Uh, that's what I did this week. Uh, next week, I'll probably going to be writing about, I don't know, the Lions or whatever. Another thing I want to plug of Arif's, just because he didn't mention it here, and it's been a couple of weeks since we recorded, is Arif did an amazing job over on the, was it the QAnon Anonymous? Uh, yeah, QAnon Anonymous. Yep. Yeah, it's been a couple of weeks. I totally forgot to plug that. That was uh, that was phenomenal. That was all about, uh, that was all about Aaron Rodgers. And really went in depth on a number of different uh, uh, topics and tried to explain why they were important or why Aaron Rodgers believed in such a thing. And later there was a uh, in-depth discussion on uh, whether or not Rivers Cuomo from, uh, from Weezer was racist. So it's all <coughs> worth checking out. It's good. It's a good one. That, that I listened to the whole thing. I, I was, uh, I was moved the ending. Uh, the ending Stella. is truly worth listening to. Just poetry, quite frankly. Uh, I was shocked. It, was, it hit me. I was like, oh, we're doing this now? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. This is, uh, it was absolutely worth it. So check that out as well. But for Arif and Dusty, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember that maybe you should just put this in a garage next time. And uh, we'll be back soon. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan. And he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and co-host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at Norse Code DN. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash norsecode, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash norsecode. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can also be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out... We hit people in the mouth.